Good afternoon and welcome to another HR Grapevine webinar. I'm Daniel Cave, Head of Content at HR Grapevine, and I'm joined today by Matthew Prisco, Client Digital Transformation Lead, and Gavin Padden, Customer Success rather, and Engagement Lead at Hemsley Fraser, who are experts in the learning space. Because uh, today's webinar entitled, How Do You Provide Learning and Engagement Experiences that drive transformative change is going to be on both those two channels, learning and engagement. Learning, we all know, important because it is one of the key differentiators in your differentiators in your EVP these days, and also in the ne necessity to have the skills that your business needs, not just today, but going forward, and the necessity to reskill workers as well. And engagement um, seen widely in HR is the silver bullet, bullet for productivity. Um, because of the importance of these, Gav and Matthew are going to lead us through some of the ways in which they lean into each other and we can drive proper engagement, not just in learning, but after the learning uh, has taken place itself. So it's going to be very, very interesting for sure. As ever, um, there's going to be a Q&A at the end, so please do send your question in, questions in using the question functionality in the webinar app and also you can see just below that on your screen, there is a download of the digital impact survey report, which basically is the top line figures and stats from the impact of digital processes on your learning. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Matthew, who's going to lead us through the content for today's webinar. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel, and uh, welcome everybody to today's session. As Daniel said, we're really going to be focusing on our thoughts, I guess, in and around what we mean by learning and engagement experiences. Um, before we do, um, I think we've already had the introduction, but my name's Matthew Prisco. I'm the Client Digital Transformation Lead here at Hemsley Fraser. And I guess ultimately I'm responsible for enabling organizations to leverage their digital strategy, particularly with a focus in and around around learning but then in turn how that impacts the organization in itself and I'm joined today by my colleague Gavin who's heading up our customer success and engagement um, efforts so I'll let Gavin quickly introduce himself. Good afternoon everyone uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this um, session as Matthew said I'm the customer success um, manager for Hermsey Fraser my role within the organization is to make sure that Every one of our clients achieves what their goals are um, in the use of um, our platform, that it's personalized, uh, that it's been delivered in the right way, that we're having the right conversations around exactly what they're looking to achieve um, from it. Of course, as a result of those conversations, the topic of engagement comes up again and again um, in terms of how we make sure that we provide the best possible experience um, for learners. Thanks, Gavin. And, and for those of you who don't know who Hemsley Fraser are, we can certainly cover that off at the end of the session. Um, we're a 30-year-old business um, specialising in uh, learning and development, uh, and our sort of a portfolio of capability spans that very broad spectrum. So let's um, start to dig in. there momentarily. Um, so let me start again. Learning and engagement for us is a, um, they're, they're similar but different. Um, I think depending where you're coming from and what you're looking at in relation to these this subject area, there's different schools of thought. I think there's the academic side of things and I think if you kind of look and do any research in and around what we mean by learning and engagement, there's various summaries and synopsises of what we think that means and I think it varies depending on who you're talking to. We certainly recognise within the context of this there's different levels of uh, learner uh, engagement, the cognitive level, the emotional level, the behavioural level, so depending what sort of school of thought you're coming from I think that there's diff that there is similarities but differences. For us I think it's more not so much about what we mean academically by learning uh, and engagement because I think engagement in itself is a much broader subject. But today we're really sort of focusing in and around 
where the two complement each other and the differences between engagement and learner engagement and what that means in the context of the organization. And I think that context is the thing that's re what we're really going to be focusing on is how do you make that connection with your organization and with the learners within? How do you drive that forward? So for us, there's, I guess, as an organization, we kind of consider it and look at it uh, on three levels. The first level is engaging people so they actually want to learn. Easier said than done. I'm sure a lot of you are L&D professionals in their own right. Um, but I think for us, it's really about um, making sure that that, re that learning feels contextualized and relevant to the audience that we're trying to reach. Um, the second level is driving impact with the learning. I know a lot of organizations uh, and particularly the L&D functions are under huge amounts of pressure to not only deliver the learning, but also prove to the board, to the people that are funding the, the learning in the first instance, that there is impact on the organization, that there is an ROI, that we are improving capability across the workforce. And I think what we're seeing the most uh, important element out of all of this is how do we align all of these efforts and make sure that they're aligned as closely to the business requirements as possible. So um, I think the, the, the number one priority for us is that kind of contextualization and relevance back to the organization. So yes, it's important to develop individuals um, in and around core competencies for their role, but ultimately what we want to be doing is developing them in their roles, but in the pursuit of something more strategically important. So from an academic perspective and from sort of a strategic focus, these are the areas that we think are, are, are key and are the, the, the challenges, I guess, of L&D in today's uh, organizations. Um, another thing to consider is the context in which we are working. So I think for us, if you think about the landscape in which we're having to develop and deliver these learning solutions. It's within the context and backdrop of the expectations of our end users, our consumers, our learners within the organizations, because we all know that people are using um, platforms and tools in their own personal time. So they in turn, either directly or indirectly, are setting a really high expectation around what engagement looks and feels like to an end user today. Um, I think this is becoming a much um, bigger issue for organizations to think about because not only do they have to worry and think about how their individuals are using these tools, um, because I think you'll find in lots of organizations there's formal strategies using platforms like Yammer and other social media platforms which are formally uh, established and rolled out, but then there's lots of informal stuff going on in the background, things like WhatsApp and Facebook and um, other social media tools which is not monitored or maintained by the uh, organization officially. So I think what we have to think about is the challenge of L&D is within the context of how people consume content today and information, it is a rapidly changing world with evolving um, platforms and social media tools which people can engage with at any time. And they in turn could actually be really great learning um, assets in their own right. Coupled with the kind of the reality, I guess, of what us as L&D professionals have to deal with uh, within the context of our own organization. And by that, I mean the kind of the, the, the legacy issues to some degree of our, our use of learning management systems, legacy HR systems, talent management systems, and all the other platforms and services and tools which are already in existence in an organization. Um, I'll point you uh, at that at this moment to a digital impact survey uh, that we did at the beginning of the year that went out to about 500 organizations that looked at how people were using and embracing technology. And I think one of the things that was clear uh, was that it wasn't a clear landscape at all. I think there is an increasingly complex um, landscape of technology, tools and platforms which people are tackling with. And that they are trying to work out what are the best mechanisms to go into an organization with, what are the tools that are gonna to be most effective in cutting through a lot of the noise 
and a lot of the technology, which sometimes can be a great enabler, but can also be a, a, a blocker. Um, so I think that's a really important point to consider in and around the, the context in which we're trying to drive learning engagement and that kind of relevance to the end user and how do we make it relevant and um, contextualized for that particular group. The other um, consideration in all of this is kind of our role um, from the perspective of HR and L&D. So we have our end user, which is obviously a critical um, person to consider, but it's also the role of HR and L&D in the organization. So a lot of our global clients are really asking us um, to address a couple of key challenges. One of which is this notion that L&D is moving out from the umbrella of HR and emerging as more of a business partner. And what we're seeing increasingly is actually this is linking into talent organ into the talent part of the business and the OD part of the business. And I think what we're trying to do is enable LD to become more of a strategic partner. Um, and if Matthew, you think about I think it's a it's a good moment to see if um, if that consideration is 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 felt within the attendees of the webinar um, today, as per the usual structure um, for these webinars, we have a couple of poll questions to, to ask. So on that particular point um, that Matt, Matthew mentioned there, um, we have the following poll question. It'd be great to get your input on. Um, and the question is, is this, um, in your own organizations, um, is your particular team viewed more as um, a cost center um, or um, a business partner? I'm going to hand over to Dan, who will manage the poll. So you'll all be able to see on your screens in front of you the question that Gavin has just put to everybody. So whether your team is viewed as more as a cost center or a business partner, it's multiple choice there. So I'm I'm going to leave that up for about 10 more seconds. I can see about 70% of you have already voted. And then Matthew and Gavin will be able to comment on the results. So just a few more seconds. I can see the overwhelming majority have voted. And there we go. So guys, what do we think? Most of them are seen as a business partner. Does that tally with what you'd expect yeah well that, can i go first um, you may first of all um the my first comment is that this is uh, this is a really positive um um outcome um it's very much from my own conversations client side um that the majority of learning and development managers or hr managers and directors are at a certain point along this journey and it's down to me and, and people like me to help feed into and provide insight um, to help people to be positioned more um, aligned with the various different business functions um, within the organization. So rather than be seen as a reactive uh, function that's providing uh, learning and development support, actually to take more of a strategic role but it's very much one of those conversations that we are continually feeding um, at the moment in order to ensure that we elevate um, the position of, of, of L&D so that everyone across the entire organization can see it actually contributing in the front rather than resolving issues uh, as and when they um, arise. Matthew what's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, I think it's. A, it, it, I'm not surprised by the poll result at all. Um, I think you know L and D are having to be this agile business partner because of the pace of change in the organisation that we're seeing. So I'm sure you're all struggling with kind of internal change at the moment, transformation, uh, perhaps change in strategy, direction, even trying to tackle that big beast of cultural change about how you shift from. Um, one business model to another and what that means in reality to the workforce that you're trying to keep engaged through that process uh, which is not particularly can be a not particularly easy one but also ensuring that you're delivering everything that the organization needs to ensure that you can deliver on, on the new strategy so I think it's it's not surprising that 
you know the audience that we have today is working in that way um i think just to build on that point i think you know if we think about the context of this again going back to kind of learning engagement and what we mean by learning i think l and d are also being asked to do a lot more than they perhaps have done have been done asked to do historically and by that i mean not only do they have to con consider the sort of the the nuts and bolts of the training uh, within the organization, but also start to think about other areas which perhaps haven't been addressed by corporate audiences um, or corporate organizations before. Certainly in that what we're seeing emerging as a, 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 a requirement and it's based on some um, research we did with the World Economic Forum about the importance of well-being and health and looking after people's personal developments like personal finances. Um, so I think organizations, again, going back to that notion of engagement and what we mean by that is not only providing learning, but also providing them with a sense that you are being looked after as an employee, that you are being given development opportunities, not only professionally, but also personally. And I think that in itself is providing challenges for the L&D organization because there's a, you know, a lot of our uh, uh, teams that we're working with are relatively lean. There's not necessarily a huge amount of budget being added into the pot of LND. So I think it's about how do you kind of remain a credible uh, business partner within the context of this kind of evolving landscape of content requirements, but also being able to facilitate support of spe specialist functions within the business. And we'll come on to discussing how we kind of support different types of audiences and the challenges that they have shortly. But I think you know the role of LND um, is not only providing that kind of context of providing learning for, for the technical skills and the soft skills, but also drifting out into other skills and certainly thinking about how do you enable and facilitate technical training um, uh, within the context of that as well. I think there's an important third point on the, the slide around um, making sure that l and um, is very deliberately focused on the business um, challenges and um, sorry to throw another poll at you, but it, again, it, it's great to kind of find out where um, most people are along um, that particular um, journey as well. Um, and, and so to that end, um, Dan, it'd be great if we could again kind of take the temperature of the room um, in that respect um, with the following question, um, which is, is learning within your organization treated more as a, a standalone function in and uh, of itself, or is it you know, fully incorporated um, and blended into uh, the standard functions within um, your business? So have a look at the options there and let us know where you feel your organization is. Thanks, Gavin. As per the previous poll, um, the options should be up on your screen now. So if you just choose the one which is most relevant to how your function operates um, within your organization, and I will leave that up there for another 10 seconds or so. I can see most of you have voted already, and then we'll be able to share those results with you in just a, just a few seconds. And there we go. So a bit bit more equal this time, but more just a standalone function appears to be the usual modus operandi. Again, guys, surprising with this split or was that to be expected? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's um, to be uh, expected. Again, it's a somewhat loaded question in in respect to the fact that you know we're all on this kind of journey to blend l and d um increasingly into um the business functions due to various different constraints practicalities and the fact that you know ultimately i personally believe that it's far more um, important to pick up on a word that matthew has mentioned um more than once um that learning is contextualized appropriately and delivered in a way that people can see real value um, in their day-to-day -day, um, work. For me, um, I'm really fascinated with um, the particular stories from clients that I work with where they're very much in the process of change. So going back to the previous poll and this one, um, 
for the organizations that have most effectively migrated from um, having L&D as a standalone function into, you know, we're very much within the working mechanisms of each particular teams, how that was brought about, how hard a fight was it um, internally, and how easy um, has it been to prove results um, on the back end of that to kind of justify uh, the whole strategy uh, in the first place. Matthew, does it pick up on any of the results that um, we we asked earlier in the year um, in the digital impact survey? It does to a degree. I think the, the thing that came out of the survey for me uh, or for us as a sort of takeaway was, uh, you've mentioned it already, but we'll repeat it. Context and relevance is is absolutely key to any learning initiative. So for me, I think you know where we see our clients being successful in engagement is when they're being able to kind of connect what they're doing back to the strategy where the LND function is absolutely flying and it's got a, a seat at the top table. It's where they really, really understand the business that they're supporting um, and they are invited to enable the strate strategic direction um, of mm -hmm. the functions to kind of achieve what they need to to deliver on that promise to their shareholders and uh, ownership and you know make life better within that company we all know the challenges of going through transformation and i think nearly every organization is struggling with that in whichever industry they're in that in mm -hmm. itself makes for uh, sometimes a challenging environment where landscapes are changing rapidly understanding of role is changing cha rapidly if there's mm -hmm. a clarity in what the organization is trying to do and people feel supported both technically and in the soft skill side of things that learner engagement suddenly becomes to life and i think there's some sort of key ingredients that you need today particularly within the context of what we discussed earlier about that kind of complex landscape of the various expectations the end users have but also the kind of the way l d have to operate in and around the current landscape that they find themselves in within the context of a corporate organization with legacy systems or systems that you haven't been involved with but have to use anyway. I think that, you know, that it's trying to make a clear path through all of that and kind of simplify it um, so that the message is clear, the learning is clear, and people really kind of understand why they're doing it and why they should invest time and effort into something um, that we all know is a challenge in today's you know, operationally busy organizations, people don't really have a huge amount of time to find for learning. So we have to find new ways of encouraging learning to take place, but in more yeah. flexible and adaptive ways. Yeah, and I think it's the thing, I don't want to jump ahead, but it's the theme that, that comes out time and time again. We have to start with um, making a proof of concept, which is then used as the thin end of the wedge to kind of prove that there's a different way to position L&D within uh, the organization to achieve a far better um, end result. Yeah, so, and I think uh, I think it's, it's a good opportunity for us to uh, transition into our client stories um, because I think what we've discussed thus far is more of a context setting thing in and around kind of the, the realities in which we find ourselves operating, um, the pressures that we're under um, as, as functions, um, and what we wanted to do was sort of showcase three different examples of how we see learner engagement or learning and engagement taking place uh, with different parts of the business with different challenges. So I think the, the notion of this um, webinar today was to talk about sort of sliding doors moment about kind of what would have done happened perhaps in the past and what we're delivering, which we like to think, in fact, can prove in, in all of these cases, is having more of an impact on the organization and the audiences um, that we're supporting. So I'm just gonna transition um, to, um, oh, excuse me. I'm going to transition to a uh, platform um, that we're using for um, Lego. So we have a what we call a learner engagement platform. This sits on top of, generally sits on top of uh, legacy systems like learning management systems and talent management systems, uh, intranets and so forth. Um, 
this kind of uses a lot of the methodology that we think is important in enabling us to deliver training into the organization. But in this context, what we're showing is how we're partnering with our friends at Lego and their global procurement function. So in this instance, if you refer back to uh, the slide that we we're looking at previously, this is kind of how L&D are supporting a global procurement function. So they came to us originally and said to us, um, could you help us with our global procurement? There's about 200 people across uh, the globe, US, Europe, APAC, various offices and locations. And what they really wanted to do was provide them with a traditional classroom experience. Um, and that was in and around two, two sort of subject streams, I guess, one of which was very technical procurement training around data analytics and procurement techniques, um, but also some softer skills to enable them to apply those uh, uh, technical skills in an appropriate way. So the challenge that they had was they were a global organization. So the idea that they could bring cohorts together was going to be cost uh, prohibitive. Also, they knew from previous experiences that providing a one or two day classroom experience was okay, but what we really wanted to do or what Lego wanted to do was enable them to have a sense of an ongoing learning journey and perhaps a sense of collaboration in and amongst their cohorts moving forward. So we worked with Lego to design, we kind of looked at the classroom piece, which is obviously a really important component of what they wanted to do. But we also looked at what could they do prior to getting to the classroom and what could they do after that classroom event. So once that dust has settled and they've left the room, how are they going to think about applying what they've learned um, over time? How are they going to think about a sense of um, community and sharing best practices moving forward? So what we were able to do with Lego, as an example, was using our methodology of Excite, Engage, Embed, and we'll come on to that uh, at a later stage, we're able to curate and create playlists of content which can get sent out to the relevant teams within the procurement function um, globally. So they're able to access this content um, immediately via their phone. So prior to coming to a classroom event, what we're able to do is push a playlist which can be looked at via a phone or a PC, and it sets some context in and around um, the program that they're going to be on, the context as to why they're on the program, what they can expect to learn, and importantly, what we can do is weave into this the voice of uh, Lego's procurement experts and senior leaders. And that voice of Lego is really critical into uh, the engagement piece because without that, that's the kind of the, the, the key ingredient, I guess, for all of this effort is explaining to their personnel what the program's for, what are they going to get from it, and what the end result will be for them as individuals and for the business moving forward. So what we're able to do is provide to the individuals in that procurement program different levels of content. So if you're a senior manager within the procurement function or perhaps a graduate who's just moved into that for the first time, we can tailor these playlists so that the content is completely relevant and contextualized to you as an individual. We can make sure that the content is aligned um, at that level. We can make sure when the classroom event takes place, everybody's hopefully on a similar page, have a similar understanding of what the classroom event's going to consist of. We can follow this up with virtual classroom capability, so uh, post learning events, discussing how they've applied the learning. And I think what we're able to do is present this in a way that's really engaging, user friendly, simple. Um, has a very uh, high uh, instructional kind of design uh, component to it. So the expectation around how easy it is to use things is so important, we can't stress it enough. If content is available via an LMS or um, a more traditional learning platform, we know that it's not necessarily always the easiest thing to do to present relevant learning. We can present a lot of learning, but not necessarily the relevant pieces of learning. So for us, it's like less is more. And the way we make less is more into reality is curating these playlists, which we're able to push out to individuals um, or teams at a push of a button, often in local languages and so on. So I think Lego is an interesting example for us because it pulls upon lots of blended opportunities for us. It thinks about playlist methodology. Um, it includes classroom and virtual classroom. It enables you to weave in the voice of the Lego business, both subject matter experts and uh, leaders, um, and kind of helps us on that engagement um, front.
Another uh, example worth sharing, I think, um, they are an organization we've been working with for a, a, a number of years. Um, some context here was prior to um, uh, us working with them, Coca-Cola European Partners was actually uh, eight or nine different companies and they merged to become one organization. And whilst that merger was taking place, learning and development um, hadn't been prioritized because of the sort of pressures of the merger. So they were looking for a partner that would be able to provide learning to the organization at scale, but also as part of their diversity and inclusion um, um, efforts, which they that they put a huge amount of importance on, they needed to be able to present content in local languages um, so that if you're in Norway or Sweden, France or Germany, you could enjoy and engage with the learning uh, in a language that you were comfortable and familiar with. And again, going back to context and relevance, making it feel and look a lot more relevant. Um, they, 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 they had that kind of broad requirement. They also had a requirement specifically in and around um, a leadership program. So as they became a new organization and they had new strategies in and around the, the beverages that they wanted to take to market and how they develop uh, products, they wanted to be able to uh, facilitate that through their mid-level uh, management program uh, or leaders. And so they asked us to help them build uh, a program for leaders. But the challenge for us with and Coca-Cola was that the classroom in itself was no longer going to be uh, relevant. They needed a way to reach people that they hadn't done before. And that's because a lot of their guys, most of the organization is sort of it sits within two functions primarily, one of which is commercial, which are the guys and girls going out to sell uh, Coke products. And the other uh, function, the critical one is supply chain. So the people that are actually making the products in the first place. So if you think about those two audiences, they are operationally extremely busy they're not necessarily in front of PCs very often. Uh, so they need a really flexible way of delivering learning into the organization. So for them, the use of mobile technology is really important. The use of using things like WhatsApp uh, and some more um, informal platforms is really important. Um, what we were able to do was kind of look at that uh, organization as a whole and think about how do we engage with them and what are the tools and techniques that we, we have available within our kit bag to make sure that the learning as and when it lands is relevant, is contextualized, is specific. So Gav, do you want to talk a bit about the, um, the way Coke is also using it uh, beyond that, that formal leadership program and the, the broader piece in the supply chain and um, commercial perspective? Yes. Um, and I think this, this refers back to the proof of concept um, point that I mentioned earlier. We do, we, we're developing uh, more and more the relationship with our current clients once we've proven um, that the initial um, projects that we've started with them have started to, to bear fruit. And it enables us to then start to have more and more conversations around the business um, to look at how our platform in this context and can help to support a whole manner of other activities um, that they that they need assistance with, um, and one that we've very very recently um, helped to build out for them um, is something called the Frontline um, Selling Skills Program. Now this has come as a result of if anyone's in the FMCG um, world, this might resonate with you uh, in particular. But I think all of us are feeling this to a certain extent. Um, um, CC, CCEP as an organization have found that their sales team um, have noticed a change in their relationship with their um, clients to the extent that they're being leaned on more and more um, to become more than just salespeople um, and develop that relationship into being more of a, a business partner to, to give them um, some idea about what's coming up and in the future to provide reassurance where that is um, relevant and at times to revisit and reevaluate the contractual relationship between the two. Um, that has required um, Coca-Cola to uh, revise um, the learning materials and support that they provide to their frontline sales teams to make sure that they've got a more broader um, skill set um, and that they have access to a lot of the kind of soft skills, I guess, that would be a broad way um, to, to categorize all of this 
kind of thing, but to make sure that their sales team are aware, understand, and are exposed to some frameworks um, around different methodologies to um, expand their toolkit and make sure that they um, retain, um, develop, and embed um, their current client relationships. So we've done this in quite a compelling way um, on our platform here by gathering together um, what may initially appear to be quite loosely um, different playlists uh, that contain um, particular micro learning uh, assets that help people become uh, aware of uh, different um, elements uh, within the areas of soft skills and particular best practices uh, within Coca-Cola um, itself. Um, this is the uh, initial screen um, and then you can click onto uh, any one of these uh, playlists in particular and you are shown in quite a manageable way um, a, a list of assets that you can then work through. The importance um, of the design here is that um, it is appropriately cut down to appear manageable. It's not a massive manual of um, sales training or a consultant developing a consultative sales approach. Um, it's compelling, it's attractive, and it's cut down into chunks that don't disrupt um, the normal way of working. So how it's been divided down in conjunction with, for example, very simply the search bar, um, enables um, people on the, on the front line uh, within Coca-Cola to have access to all of the materials that they need uh, in a cut down way uh, that doesn't mean that I have to take an entire week um, out of work um, in order to make sure that they, they keep up to date uh, with all of this information and upskill themselves uh, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, thanks Gav. And I think, you know, the, the headlines really for this engagement with Coca-Cola was there's a number of things really thinking when you think about what's driving the engagement because we've got the MI that shows the value that the employees have who are going into formal classroom events uh, get from that, from sort of the feedback that we're able to collate and present as um, MI. We're also able to collate data on the way people are engaging with the content. And I think what we can see is there's a number of things driving the engagement. The fact that we can provide it in uh, relevant languages, the fact that it's got very senior sponsorship by the business and the C-level take it very seriously, so they're really sponsoring it at a very senior level, has a huge amount of credibility into the whole effort in the first instance. If you can align it to that level of support, it suddenly feels, looks and feels important, um, and I think that importance and relevance is critical. The way Coca-Cola operate is because they are operationally busy, they would need to have you know, the formal learning, which needs to take place, particularly for, for the programs like the leadership program. But to Gav's point, it's about how do we present learning in a micro uh, bite-sized way that looks and feels really easy, interesting and engaging. Um, mm -hmm. It's how do we curate that content and make it relevant for those people uh, in, in the business. So there's no point giving somebody 10,000 videos if all they need is the 100 which is pertinent to a commercial person or pertinent to a supply chain person. It's really about how do we kind of make sure that we're focusing the content uh, at the right level and the right audience so that people aren't overwhelmed and they, you know, going back to our earlier point about keeping it as simple as possible, you need to present it in a way that's engaging, clear, self-intuitive. We don't need to show anybody how to use it. It gets pushed to them, they look at it on their phone or PC and off they go, they're in, into the learning experience. And I think that's, you know, that's, it's easy to say, somewhat more difficult to actually execute, particularly given the complexities in which we're operating sometimes as L&D professionals. Yeah, and I think this is this is just the start of, of, of how we, with this particular um, client, work towards making sure that you know, learning is taking place within the, you know, the standard mode of working for that um, particular team. So I don't want to get a reputation as the guy who does the polls, but I do have another poll question. Um, for all of you um, on this particular point. Um, just using this as a very loose example, um, I wondered within your own organizations, um, to what extent um, learning takes place within the actual flow of work. So um, micro learning assets, small pieces of learning or training sessions here and there um, versus you know, sending a whole team away for a week 
you know, to, to, to use the two extremes. So uh, as Gol, uh, uh, as Gavin, our rev resident poll man, has uh, just <laughs> just, just introduced, we we do have the poll up on your screen now. So please do tick the appropriate op um, option that is relevant to how learning works in your organisation. Again, it should be the kind of the whole range there of options that we've given given to you. Um, I can see that most of you have voted as well. So uh, once again, I'll leave it for a few seconds just to give everybody the chance to get involved. And there we go. So a mixed picture, which is mm -hmm. actually kind of reflected in the three options that appear to be 16%, 16% and 10% is that there are a variety of different methods and whether it's weaved into the workflow or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess a needs must appears to be quite prevalent there as well. So, um, so Gav, what do you think? Well, I mean, firstly, I'm fascinated by what, what other actually means. We should have put please specify um, on that one. This is the, I kind of, I think from more of an operational perspective, this is the um, area of work, Dan, that I'm, that I'm doing, putting in mo the most number of hours um, with, with my clients and the client conversations, because this is, this is the level at which we can, we can drive the most results at the micro level. I guess the previous two poll conversations are more um, at the strategic um, level. So this is what we're doing with the most active and, uh, um, and um, committed uh, clients that we have. These are the programs that, that we're rolling out across increasingly different parts of the business. So this is where I'm regularly meeting clients. We just check the rollout of the previous program, have a look at the data, make sure that we've got high usage, high user numbers, a lot of feedback, a lot of results to crunch through as well. Because in the Coca-Cola example, I think you can all see but when you present that kind of program, it's cut down, it's relevant, it's contextualized, but we haven't necessarily specified the learning path or learning journey um, uh, um, specifically um, for learners. And that allows us from the data perspective to dig into that and have a look at what particular um, pieces of learning people find for themselves. And from that, we can make some extrapolations on what it is that the sales team, in this case, need most uh, based on the frequency uh, that, that they land on. So from a project perspective, this is, this is where we're going laterally across um, all of our client functions to prove from department to department that this is an extraordinarily um, effective way to get people more involved um, and have more agency um, in their learning um, as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's not surprising, really, that that kind of spread of uh, thought. Um, I think it, it, it does. It's quite an interesting kind of um, way to segue into our final kind of client example, which is Greystar. So um, the context of, of this is that Greystar are a very large organization, but we're supporting um, a slightly smaller business in, in, in Europe. Um, still not uh, small by any stretch of the imagination, but not as big as the American function. And they, they've been growing very quickly. They're a property investment and management organization of various business lines. Um, they've been growing at a, a huge amount of, uh, um, at a great rate. Um, L&D is catching up with the organization as we speak. So they wanted to, they recognized the fact that they needed to formalize and make learning and development more consistent. Um, they had never done that in any sort of scalable or repeatable way or really thought about it in any meaningful way. So they've it, they've invested in a team of experts, um, learning experts who are unable to deliver a learning and development strategy into the organization. But because it was such a new thing, I think Greystar themselves had a, a, a sort of a more fundamental issue. It's not just about kind of providing learning, but making learning look and feel part of the business for the first time. So they are kind of blending and merging the lines between engagement, communication, marketing. And what they're doing is, we think in a really interesting way, is not only kind of enabling work to take place in the flow of work, but also blurring the lines between what people perceive learning is within the organization. 
Um, as an example of that, um, we've, they, they, they're kind of pushing out a playlist on a regular basis. We're enabling them to, to sort of have the capability to do that. But going to the, you know, thinking about the engagement piece, what they're able to do is push content into the organization um, on subjects which not necessarily are formalized as parts of um, uh, learning and development, but make people aware of sports days, um, shout outs, you know, feedback from client visits, um, feedback from customer experiences. And what they're able to do is weave into this platform the voice of the business, which brings back that idea of context and relevancy and in driving engagement because of it. We've seen a massive increase in uh, engagement with this organization because they've wo woven in that voice, those playlists, where it's relating back to subjects outside of traditional learning and development. That's still taking place and is successful, but where we've really seen the engagement take off is when they thought about it in a sort of more holistic way. So they've started to put in, as you can see on screen here, um, a whole playlist on sustainability. Um, it's a really important subject for them as an organization. They're able to capture a video from Lexi, who's their sustainability expert. So she's able to kind of contextualize it and make it relevant. And they're able to push that into the business. And because they're sort of approaching it in a slightly different way, not too formal, but providing them with really sort of relevant content and information, um, it's kind of blurring the lines between engagement and everything else that goes alongside of it. So um, I think that's kind of an interesting point because you can certainly think about it in a formal way and we can support a program like a leadership program in this way, but also you can kind of enable content to be shared in a very uh, fluid and easy way and perhaps um, uh, slightly less informally or slightly more informally, um, enabling people to engage and use content that they feel comfortable with. So we know for a fact video content is massively popular, but people do have different learning styles. So somebody might prefer to read a book or an article or uh, might, might prefer to look at an infographic. It depends on what the level of learning is that's required. Ultimately, it's about how do you contextualize and make it relevant for the organization. And we think this is an interesting example of where they've kind of making, kind of blurring the lines between the formal learning effort and kind of broader subjects, which are important and give people the sense of a, a home, a community, a place to share information. In some regards, almost replacing a, a more traditional intranet type environment. I don't know, Gav, if you have anything additionally you want to slides and start the Q&A. Well, I was, going to, I was just going to say a quick point on that, particularly like any um, corporate comms um, attendees today. They've been I've had some really quite effective um, conversations with clients recently about how to utilize the fact that if it's sustainability week in your organization, um, it is far more preferable for you to um, put all of the information into a visually appealing playlist like the one that Matthew just um, demonstrated. That allows the email that you send to the business to be really short, really snappy, and really compelling. And in the most recent examples, we've borrowed from, you'll all have seen it from your journeys around the web. When you click on a, an important article to read, it tells you how long it's going to take for you to consume that information. So. In the sliding doors comparison, if we have, you know, a, a really extreme version of ineffective corporate communications, which is five waffly paragraphs around sustainability, um, and you know, that's so long that most people can't even sustain consciousness before the end of the email. And if you compare that with something that's really snappy, really to the point. It's already relevant and contextualized in the sense that it is sustainability week in your organization, but you, you write the message and the call to action is clear. Click here um, to, for a three minute video on, how, on what sustainability means in our organization from our head of sustainability. So it takes um, your colleagues far less than a minute to read the email. They already know what they're letting themselves in for when they click on the link, i.e. a two minute video. Uh, because you can you can uh, let them know that so they click through they they can spare two minutes 
Um, and then they're viewing this video, um, but it's the first um, asset in a playlist of sustainability. And then we're into a numbers game of what percentage of those people who read the email click through, what percentage of the people who click through and view the first video asset of one of their colleagues, um, then go on to continue down um, the rest of the playlist. And um, I'm pleased to report, although obviously I'm somewhat biased in this respect, that the numbers are extraordinarily good there. And that's why we're opening up this conversation and working with more and more uh, departments around our, our clients' businesses. Um, yeah, so that's my point on that one, Matthew. Thanks, Kev. So I think we just... Um coming to the end of our presentation and conversation. Um, one thing that we wanted to share with you was, you know, on the more formal side of things where you are kind of trying to develop programs as it were, um, or any kind of learning initiative, we do have a methodology which we tend to repeat time and time again. And it's based on uh, the three E's, excite, engage, embed. So the excite phase, um, is the initial start starting point. So if we take the sustainability um, piece as an example that we just looked at at Graystar, it's the video introduction. It's hopefully sowing some seeds of interest, intrigue, potentially excitement in the subject. The second phase of that is the engage, which is a deeper dive into the subject. So it could be a subject matter expert session, it could be a one-on-one -on -one with your manager, it could be a traditional classroom event, a virtual classroom. And then finally, the embed phase, which is really important um, at thinking about how you actually apply that learning. Um, so we're always thinking about our playlists and our learning programs within the context of these three areas. Um, we think it's really critical to success. And again, going back to that kind of learner engagement, having that mapped out in a way that kind of um, doesn't feel too prescriptive, it just feels natural. Um, obviously the end user doesn't necessarily experience those three uh, bullet points in that way, but they would, their program would consist of, um, or their playlist would consist of all elements of uh, are taking that approach in, in hand. Um, you know, our capabilities are in and around providing the services, the content and the platform that you need to be able to deliver that in an agile and quick and easy and seamless way um, that we've been talk discussing and looking at today. Um, and that um, concludes our presentation. So what we really wanted to do was open up the floor to the questions that you may have jotted down as we've been talking through this. Um, we've got five or six minutes left to answer as many as we possibly can. Be really keen to get your input um, thoughts on our conversation today um, and to see if any of that it has resonated and uh, if you have any um, questions or want to discuss any particular points uh, we, we would be delighted to answer those questions now. So thank you very much Matthew and Gavin for taking us through um, the content around how exactly how you can drive better engagement during the learning process and how it can kind of bend and align to the business need as it were I guess that's the top line of it. As mm. Matt has just laid out we do have five more minutes for questions. I know some of you have already been putting some in the question chat as we go through, which, which is great. But if you have got a pressing question, please do put it down now and we can try and answer it. Um, just a quick last reminder as well, that the digital impact survey report, which is all about the impact of digitalization on your learning processes is available as a handout in this webinar. So please do click on that and download as well. Um, there's, there's a few that have come, questions that have come through already um, so I'll put the first one to Matt I guess so how much does engagement in a learning context rely on our colleagues taking control of their own development so I guess this was about ownership and autonomy wasn't it guys yeah I think that's a really good question I think it really depends I think um, this notion that if you build it they will come kind of works ish if you think about the amount of content that's currently available today, both kind of through formally through um, you know, vendor relationships internally within an organization or even things like YouTube and Google, there's a huge amount of content you can get to. So I would never expect a massive utilization if it's just content you're making available. For me, where self-service and sort of individual kind of um, use of content comes to life when you can make it relevant like we were looking at with coca-cola um, and you know, making content specific for the supply chain made available in bite-sized pieces in a very clear and easy to use way i think that's when we can expect and do see 
really high levels of engagement. When you just make a library available, not so much. Um, it does, the, the, the dynamic does change when you're on a more formal program, because often those people have a vested interest in that program. They tend to be part of a cohort. They have a more sort of um, emotional investment in the learning, hopefully. Um, and so therefore we would expect that to be see, uh, higher. And indeed, if you look at, we, again, we can see the sort of the usage and engagement um, on our tools and platforms for those on a formal program is it is is high um, because it often is being referred to and there's a relevance and context there. So I think it depends on um, the type of content you're making available can really have a massive impact on the utilization. I guess a follow up to that might be as well that you talked about, you know, if you just leave a, a cache of content in a place and don't really share it or, or, or position it in the right way, how important is the internal marketing, the pitch and the language to getting people to engage with the the learning content? How how important is that in the first place? Yeah, I think the engage the marketing and the communication is critical. Again, it's how do you cut through the noise of everything that's going on in an organization, in and around, you know, day, you know, normal operation, normal workload trying to get people's time and attention in this complex landscape of stuff, which is forever available, is hard. So I think organizations do have to really think about how they're presenting their learning, why they're presenting it, and why do you think somebody's gonna take some time and effort to engage in that kind of learning experience, be it a bite-sized piece of content or a more formalized program experience. I think the more you can do with communication and marketing, the better. And I think there is an expectation that people are, um, it, it, it gets promoted in that, in that certain way, because that's how they're engaging with other tools and platforms outside of the work environment. So we have to mirror to some extent what's going on uh, outside of the work environment and try and apply some of those principles uh, within the working uh, context. Okay, thank you. I think we've got time for one more. So if I give sure. both Matthew and Gavin 30 seconds each to respond to um, this really good question, which is how important is the use of tech or technology in the engagement conversation? So uh, Gavin, uh, over to you first. I think it, I think it has to, technology has to be used in its right place. So we've, we've, we've had conversations with clients who know that they have to invest more in tech and they're using it uh, to some extent as a crutch uh, and as a direct replacement for perfectly workable um, face-to-face program. So while I think it's true that the companies increasingly need to invest in tech, the key here is blending and using technology to leverage um, it for its, for its appropriate function. Um, pre and post face-to-face -face training sessions in and around CSR activities, for example. Um, so just to utilize it in the right way. And I think we're probably going to see another year of uh, quite a sort of experimental exploration in this area before we become a bit more formalized in, in its proper application. Yeah, and I guess, that? yeah, I, I, just to sort of conclude really, I think for me it's really about keeping it as simple as possible um, given that landscape of operation that we find ourselves in. The simpler you can make it, the easier you can make it. If tech can provide that, then fantastic. If it can't, then you're always going to be, you know, technology could be a, a blocker rather than an enabler. So I think for me, if you can find the right tech and the right approach that makes it as easy to use as possible uh, without any issues, then that's absolutely fantastic and a brilliant tool. Otherwise, I think you're always going to be on the back foot with that particular approach. Thank you. That seems like the perfect time to leave it. So thank you very much to everyone for attending. Thank you to Matthew and Gavin both from Hemsley Fraser for leading us through the content and some really, really good examples of how learning experiences can be crafted in the best way uh, for today. So thank you once again. Um, please tune in to the next webinars that we're doing. You can go to hrgreatmind.com and check them out there. Um, so yeah, have a good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, um, thanks everyone.